Hello, my name is Sam Felton and welcome to Expert Interviews on Smash the Fat with me on this glorious uh, morning here in London, but over there uh, in Sydney, Australia is Sarah Wilson of I Quit Sugar. How are you doing, Sarah? Hi, I'm fantastic actually. It's a it's a wintry morning, or sorry, I should say evening here. Um, <laughs> It's the first day of winter here and uh, it's probably about the average temperature of one of your summers, I've got to say. We've had a, the hottest May on record. Sugar. So, I don't, yeah, 20 days over 25 degrees, I think it's been. So, Seriously? Yeah, it's like summer. Yeah. Oh my gosh, yeah, that's our summer. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, lucky you, lucky you. Uh, now, uh, I became sort of <clears throat> aware of you because IQuitSugar.com has been being shared around the health and fitness community like there's no tomorrow. It's literally gone viral. You guys must have seen some numbers going through the roof. Um, and then I have the opportunity to read I Quit Sugar and I Quit Sugar for Life, which are fantastic books, which I have right here. Like these Just two the right here, absolutely <laughs> fantastic. Um, and they're such as aesthetic, uh, entertaining, and informative um, books uh, that are really well Thank structured, Sarah. So congratulations on that. Uh, and they've kind of been a bit of an international bestseller. Um, so tell us how you came to to write these incredible books and set up this incredible website and kind of start this almost sugar revolution in Australia yeah. and the world. By accident is the short answer. Um, <laughs> actually, I've been a journalist for 20 years and um, I was writing a column for a weekend newspaper magazine and I was short of the topic, I mean, if truth be known, and this was three and a half years ago, January 2011. And um, so I thought, oh, I should probably quit sugar. I've been told for some time uh, that I should. I've got an autoimmune disease. It was not getting much better. Um, I would got very, very sick. And so I'd been on the back burner. But I was addicted, so of course I had a lot of resistance. Um, nothing like a deadline to make you do something you don't want to do. So um, I committed to it for just two weeks because as a journalist, you don't, you know, you just give it a go. You touch the surface, you know. Um, I gave it a go, and I, after two weeks, I felt much better. Um, my skin cleared up, and to be honest, my vanity is what kept me going because I went, mm -hmm. oh, my skin just changed. Changed. People were commenting on it, and not just pimples, but I was at that age where you got pimples and wrinkles, um, and it just the wrinkles softened. Um, people were actually commenting on it on how well I looked, and that'd been the first comments that I'd received along those lines in a long time because I'd had this autoimmune disease for, for a number of years. So um, I just decided to keep going and going and going, and it's kind of my approach with exercise, and I'm sure you'd relate to this, Sam. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I just go, look, I'll just go for a 20 minute minute jog. And because I haven't overcommitted and I've treated it as a just a gentle thing to go and do, to enjoy some fresh air, I kind of end up going for 35 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, that's generally how I do things. Commit at a low base and always there's always room for expansion. So three and a half years later, I'm, I'm still on that kind of experimental journey. And I do see it as an experiment. And it's seen me um, investigate all the, you know, the studies into how sugar interacts in our body, how much sugar do we need, how long does it take to break an addiction, you know, are all of us addicted, um, you know, a whole range of different things. And I became quite obsessed with the topic and uh, realised that there was no program or sort of clear set of instructions for people on how to quit sugar. There was lots of information emerging as to why we should, um, yeah. but nobody had actually looked into some techniques. So I think that's where I was able to step in. And having worked, I was the editor of Cosmopolitan. I hosted MasterChef Australia here. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I had a media platform to work from. But I also understood how the mainstream thought. And it's preaching to the unconverted um, that I'm really passionate about, you know. Um, people like yourself, Sam, don't need to be told what, you know, I was learning. Sure. It's the mums and dads out in the suburbs, you know, yeah. people who don't necessarily have access. And so, um, yeah, I put together these programs. I turned it into an e-book because people mm -hmm. were saying, can I have all the information in one spot? And I thought, oh, I might sell 100 copies. I uh, sold a few more than that. And um, a publisher, a print book publisher, came and approached me and said, could we turn it into a print book? So it was kind of, it's a rolled along. And so it felt very natural. It felt um, mm -hmm. 
I didn't feel like too much of a fraud because I was able to get feedback from people as I went along while it was yeah. still online. Um, I was able to correct my mistakes, be very transparent, and by the time it came out as a print book, I was very confident of the matter. So it was able to then go out to even more people, and I was like, okay, I'm pretty sure all of this is pretty sound, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's a good uh, it's worked. Um, So, yeah, and then, of course, it's now out in about 25 countries around the world, and it's... Uh, a New York Times bestseller, um, mm -hmm. and yeah, I, I've not forced the message, and anyone who's read the book knows that um, being mm -hmm. gentle and not being draconian and not sort of talking about it all the time is very much part of my message. Yeah, absolutely, um, and it is. It's a it's a very kind of uh, laid back approach, very Australian approach, in fact, Sarah. Um, and um, you've got a really good eight week program in the in the first book. I quit. Sugar, um, so sort of going going through that, um, you kind of start off with start start to cut back. It's not sort of jump straight in uh, with quitting yeah. sugar cold turkey straight away, but you sort of start to cut back, and then you sort of then you start to reduce it more and more, and then by week three is when you really start to sort of right, let's quit. This is it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but before yeah, yeah. that, the in between bit, there's a there's a little special secret um, <laughs> that's uh, that's known as eating the fat, which many of our uh, listeners and viewers all know. Um, but for anybody that hasn't um, hasn't absorbed come across, uh, yeah, absorbed the message quite yet. Um, why why should we be eating the fat when we quit in sugar? Well, I mean, there's a number of reasons. Um, a big part of what um, the program is about, it's not just about, you know, quitting sugar and trying to lose a whole bunch of weight. Um, mm -hmm. It's quite the opposite. Well, it's not quite the opposite. It's, um, it's, it's, just, it's just not what I set out for it to be about, and I encourage people not to have that as their focus. Initially, of course, it often is. People come to quitting sugar because they want to lose a bit of extra weight. Mm -hmm. But um, essentially, it's about retraining your metabolism um, and your appetite. Um, so... First thing is that fat and protein replace the psychological aspect of, of the snacks that you've probably been addicted to. Anyone who's addicted to sugar has been probably snacking, eating five to six times a day. And snacks, of course, are generally sugary, even if they're so-called savoury. So um, it's, it's a bit cruel to kind of come off all of that in you know one fell swoop. So you know a simple technique is to replace it for emotional reasons primarily, you know, so that you have something to look forward to. Um, the second thing is that we need to be satiated. Um, a lot of people feel a lack you know, that empty feeling that, you know, they need to feel like they've got something filling them up. Fat and protein do that, of course. You know, they're satiating. They switch on the appetite hormones, which are pretty much blunted by sugar. So sugar turns off that leptin mechanism in the brain, which not only sees us eat more sugar, but eats us sees us eat more of everything. So with fat and protein, um, they turn on the right hormones and you get full. So getting full is really important, I think, on when you're mm -hmm. quitting sugar because, you know, otherwise you're reaching for something. You're feeling that, you know, we're not used to feeling, um, you know, sort of hungry and then full again, hungry and then full again, you know, where we, when we're on that blood sugar roller coaster, we never get the opportunity for our appetite the hormones to kick in correctly. Um, so it's that, but it's also about longer term, switching our bodies, I suppose, to put it crudely, from a, uh, a sugar-burning machine to a fat-burning machine. And that's putting it really crudely. But essentially, that's what we're doing. And the way I describe it in sort of layman's terms, for anyone who's finding that this is all very new to them, is that it's like uh, when, you, when you're eating sugar, you can keep your metabolism um, metabolic fire going, burning all day, but it's like throwing kero or twigs or paper on a fire. It'll burn, but you've got to keep it maintained, you know, mm -hmm. constantly going back to it, constantly obsessed by food, um, mm -hmm. snacking, you know, throughout the day. Um, but when you eat fat and good quality fat and protein, it's like putting a log on the fire. You dump it on the fire, it, you know, so you stoke it a little bit and off you go for five hours and get on with the rest of your day and your body burns nice and evenly and slowly and then it starts to die out and what do you know, it's lunchtime, you know. Yeah. Um, so it's about retraining your body to operate in this way and so fat and protein fulfills yeah, several, several roles in that whole kind of... Um, you know, sort of uh, alteration. 
Absolutely, absolutely. And, and what uh, what do you feel are kind of the best things for for when you initially quit sugar? What were kind of your your staples to try and sort of stay away from trying to indulge in any sugar? Oh, so my best go to secret, um, halloumi <laughs> cheese. Yeah. Um, so I found you could do like oh, 101 things I could do with a piece of halloumi <clears throat> cheese. And I think the UK um, listeners and viewers would be familiar with it. You know, Greek restaurants Very serve much, it. Yeah. You can get it in most supermarkets. Slice it up, um, pan fry it um, mm -hmm. or grill it. Um, a bit of cinnamon that works really well with cinnamon. And cinnamon is fantastic for curbing, you know, sort of your sugar cravings as well. And it has a sweet taste to it. So the cinnamon and rock salt and maybe some walnuts as well. Mm -hmm. I've got a recipe in the first book where I actually combine a bit of apples, so half an apple sliced, you know, sliced up and um, grilled alongside the halloumi, and it caramelises a bit. Um, and that's a quite a good way to eat your fruit. It basically slows down that fructose dump. Um, is if you're eating it with the cheese. Um, macadamia nuts, I think, are fantastic. Um, they're particularly abundant in Australia because they're native here. But any kind of nuts, preferably activated, if you can. Um, soak them, um, that will actually assist your, your, your bowel movements. A lot of people do suffer constipation uh, yeah. when they're quitting sugar just because of the changes they're undergoing and because they do tend to eat a lot of nuts. You know, a lot of people contact me and go, I haven't, you know, been to the toilet in three days. I'm like, well, you might want to tone down, tone down the nuts. The other thing is um, coconut oil, and I know many of your listeners would be, uh, you know, right. familiar with yeah. the benefits. Um, I've got to say it is my secret weapon um, it, it, you know, and still to this day I still have blood sugar issues because of my autoimmune disease and I still have to, you know, I think it's what keeps me real in this whole kind of thing, you know, mm -hmm. it's not like I'm 100% cured and completely sugar free and don't have problems. I think <laughs> my autoimmune disease ensures I, I stay up to date with every, where everybody's at. Um, but yeah, I'll have a tablespoon of coconut oil after lunch. I often mix it with half a teaspoon of raw cacao and that's my chocolate, mm -hmm. you know, and my God, if you want to A, curb your cravings and B, shut down your appetite until dinner time. Coconut oil will do it. Um, so they're probably my favourites. Um, licorice tea will also do it. I'm not a mm -hmm. big fan of it, but if I've got really bad sugar cravings, um, one or two cups of licorice tea will just make me really not interested in sugar. So, um, yeah, those, those things generally help a lot of people, actually. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, that's one thing that kind of struck me about I Quit Sugar is that it is, it's a really practical book. Um, you don't just have the eight-week plan in there, but you've got about 100 recipes as well at the end, some very nice ones. I tried the avocado cooling soup the other day, which was rather, rather delicious. Um, and th that's probably another sort of good way to sort of curb craving sort of that mid-afternoon, just to just have something like that. Um, and that'll sort of, yeah, keep you totally full until dinner time. Yeah. Um, and then uh, talking about sort of kind of, we, we even though we're sort of like, we're sort of the presenters of this health and fitness information, we still all have our own problems, right, in terms mm -hmm. of still trying to fight against the, an unhealthy society, so to speak, right? Um, and yeah. you, kind of, you kind of followed up I Quit Sugar with I Quit Sugar for Life, um, which is kind of like a, a follow-up of sort of trying to um, maybe reiterate the message but incorporate even more recipes and sort of more up-to-date science and yeah. advice. Yeah, well, I mean, there's a couple of things I do in the second book. It's kind of um, almost my little um, launch pad for all the things I really believe in or my little um, mm. soapbox um, hobbies. So um, I'm very much into food wastage or, or stamping out food wastage. Um, I'm also into all kinds of sustainable eating. So I promote eating meat, but I really say it comes with the caveat that you eat it in a sustainable way and mindfully. So pasture-finished meats, um, wherever possible of course mm -hmm. um, you know um, organic chicken chicken should always be organic for a whole run range of reasons which I go into in the book so um, I make all of that very affordable so all of my recipes um, incorporate various all the principles that I outline in the front half of the book um, so using sustainable cuts of meat I don't use any chicken breast for instance I use mm -hmm. um, you know um, osobuco lamb shanks um, offal. There's some offal recipes in there. Um, so all of that kind of stuff, introducing people to some of those fundamentals. Um, but the other thing um, that I do is I pull apart 
a lot of the very fashionable dietary theories and sort of outline why some of them are a waste of time um, and what parts of them have got some scientific gravitas which is worth taking note of. And then I apply those principles that I can feel have some worth into my recipes. So they're kind of sprinkled and drip fed throughout. And um, I'm a big fan of the Ayurvedic tr tradition, which is an Indian way of living. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's about using food and meditation and yoga to not uh, fix your problems, but to balance your dosha or your, I guess, your trait, your personality and, and character mm -hmm. traits out. Um, in my case, I'm a vata. I speak very fast. I, I'm, I've got... Um, you know, high energy and, you know, I can sort of loop up into the air and I need things that can ground me. So, you know, some of my foods in, uh, are about grounding you, you know, uh, a grounding root vegetable soup, you know, uh, for anybody who finds that their butter is out of control, they're stressed and agitated. So I don't drum those into, you know, too much. I don't mm -hmm. ram them over, you know, ram them down the th everybody's throat, so to speak. But I just incorporate them in a sort of an effortless way. Um, yeah. with one pot meal all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, it's kind of a whole conglomeration of all my cooking and eating and exercise and uh, mm. morning routine principles, all of those things, and it comes through through, through the food. Awesome. Um, so what does kind of your your perfect healthy day look like then? Okay, well, always a morning routine. I really do believe in morning routines. All the wonderful experts around the world, health experts and just leaders, you know, from the Dalai Lama through to Richard, Sir Richard Branson. Yeah. Um, Bruce Forsyth. You know, I don't know if you know Bruce yeah, Forsyth. No. <laughs> he, he, he's he's um, the presenter of um, Strictly Come Dancing over here in the UK. But, yeah, yeah, not one of, not one of my, not on top of mind for one of my big guru wellness people. But anyway, um, <laughs> They all have um, this in common. That's a, a morning routine. So they wake up, and it might—it's a variation of things, but generally it involves exercising first thing. Um, and I do that. So I get up. I have hot water with some um, apple cider vinegar. Um, I go and exercise straight away. I don't dilly dally. I don't wait and make sure I can find my right drink bottle. I just literally have a pile of running, swimming, what yoga clothes in my laundry and I just put it on and out the door. Um, and then I, yeah, so I'll do either yoga, I do an ocean swim, I will go for a gentle run, I do some stair climbing, I've got a, a mean set of stairs near my house. I'll do some weights inside my house, you know, when I've only got Sweet. 20, 30 minutes, um, using wine bottles. <laughs> um, <Right. laughs> yeah, and then... Um, yeah, and I, I sort of occasionally join a gym. It generally, my membership generally lasts three months. I do a three-month stint, and then I give it a bit of a break. And then sure. I then I come home. I meditate in the sun mm -hmm. every day. Um, I have that luxury here in Australia. And and then I'll come home and um, eat some breakfast. Um, you know, I don't start work until I've done all of that and, you know, that's a real effort. It takes an effort. I want to check my emails. I want to get launched into things some days. But having a morning routine means that all those really important things are done. You know, we have a willpower muscle that runs out by about 5 o'clock in the afternoon and anyone who thinks that they're going to get exercise done in the afternoon, I mean, there's about a 50% chance that they'll actually get there. If you just say mm -hmm. you're going to do it in the morning, it's more likely to happen. So it's done, you feel good, you, your whole system's working as it needs to, your metabolism is fired up, and, um, yeah, you can start on your day. So that's that's kind of my perfect start to the day. Breakfast, I'm not a keen breakfast person. It's just the way I am. I don't eat a huge mm -hmm. breakfast. I'll generally eat some spinach with an egg stirred through it and some oil over the top. I have a black coffee uh, sort of four times a week and then uh, or a green tea, and then... Lunchtime comes around, it's generally some, I always bring my lunch to the office, it's some slow cook. Today it was um, osobuco, um, that I, you know, I freeze it in portions and I, you know, defrost it and I had that with some kale and half a zucchini. Uh, dinner tonight is roast pork that I'm cooking for some friends. Um, nice. We're going to have that with red cabbage sautéed with some leek and some sweet potato. So with a glass of red wine. Gorgeous. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. That sounds like a very healthy, balanced kind of lifestyle right there. Well, um, yes. It needs to be. It needs to be to balance out all the rest of the stress and anxiety that I tend to, you know, have around me. 
Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I really kind of find that interesting about kind of the, the philosophy side of things and kind of life is a, a philosophical journey. Um, and as you're kind of stating there, it is about trying to embrace what is useful to you um, and sort of disregarding yeah. what is useless in that kind of Bruce Lee kind of way. Um, and not trying to sort of judge people that identify themselves by sort of you know, by a certain kind of way of eating or a kind of way of exercising, like, yeah. uh, namely kind of CrossFit or sort of like even like the um, low-carb, high-fat um, community as well. Um, yeah. But like, you could, it's all about kind of being flexible and adaptable and, as we just said, yeah. embracing what's useful and disregarding what is useless to you as, a, as an individual as well because that's what we've always got to try and, try and remember. And that's kind of the... The um, the impression that I get from the books would that be a fair statement? Yeah, I mean, I do think that everybody is different, and the big thing is that I guess my message is to be gentle, but also to treat things as an experiment, to remain curious, to not get too rigid in your thinking, and I suppose. That's always worked for me, both me personally with my own health. Um, it also helped me with communicating my message, but it's also helped with all the detractors. I'm sure you caught this as well. You know, dietitians weighed in, and invariably, dietitians funded by the sugar industry. Um, you know, um, people who've got issues with what I'm, you know, saying, but they haven't actually read what I'm saying. You know, I'm not. My book's called "I Quit Sugar," not "You Must Quit Sugar." It's I quit sugar, I gave it a go, this is what worked for me and mm. you know, if you would like to try it then here's some you know, suggestions on how to do it for yourself. Um, yeah. So I think it really does twist things around because we do have a lot of people who want to be told exactly what to do. They want to be told what's wrong and what's right and am I allowed to eat this? You know, and it's a real shift to actually tell people, well, Yes, for eight weeks, I really do suggest coming off it and being, you know, really firm with yourself. Yeah. At the end of those eight weeks, it's over to you, you know. I personally eat one to two pieces of whole fruit a day, um, just depending on how I feel. Different times of the year, I feel like a different quantity. At the moment, I'm having an orange every day just because yeah. that's what my body's just wanting. Um, and then, you know, I'll have some dark chocolate. I love dark chocolate. Mostly I make it myself um, and it doesn't have any sweetener in it. It's just coconut oil and cacao, like I said before. Um, but I'll have some, you know, lint 85% every now and then, um, you know, once or twice a week. Um, I enjoy my red wine. I, I make these decisions for myself. I know what works for me. Um, and, you know, I advise that six to nine teaspoons a day as an ongoing thing is a, is a good benchmark to work to. I don't sit there and, you know, calculate, you know, how much sugar I've had every day. But at the back of my mind, when I'm thinking about foods, you know, if I'm going, hmm, I'm feeling a bit weird, oh, that's right, I've already eaten two pieces of fruit today and then I had several blocks, you know, squares of chocolate and, all right, yeah, time to go really savoury for dinner tonight. I'm just going to have something with no sauce, you know, maybe a pork chop and some steamed veggies and, you know, um, I just kind of modulate things. So I think once you get sugar out of your system, you're no longer a food addict, you're no longer yeah. a slave to your food. And I often say you actually experience, and this is the most important thing I think, is you experience food freedom. So you actually start eating like you did as a kid, where you actually know when you're full. I think that part of the problem is, is that you know most people today do not know their own appetite. They've lost complete, you know, um, contact with it. And um, I've got to say that's one thing that I just totally appreciate from this process is, is the food freedom that I feel. I can eat, and I, my body tells me it guides me. I don't have to mm -hmm. think about it all day. You know, the log on the fire. I chuck a log on, a nice big meal. I eat a proper lunch. Uh, and then I'm not thinking about food until, you know, around about 6.30. That's awesome. That's awesome. Because, yeah, sugar sugar really is kind of a, a hijacker, you know. I mean, it totally hijacks the system. And oh, it's a total pest. Yeah, it yeah. really is, isn't it? Um, it's, um, it's something that can sort of, like, tell you to eat more and more and more and sort of, like, drive you towards those sugary foods and, and can even sort awesome. of have serious, serious metabolic effects on your circadian rhythm, disrupt your sleep. Um, and all sorts. Um, it's just yeah. not 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 that great of a thing. Um, but uh, we do have some questions via 
Facebook. Um, yes. And the, 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 the one question that's been asked kind of a few times, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll quote Phil Thompson from Sheffield's question, um, is that are you only okay. concerned about fructose? Uh, and I noticed the use of uh, rice malt syrup a few times in some of the in some of the recipes. So is the argument that fructose is the sole agent we need to address, and carbs are okay? Okay, so to answer that question, it's a little bit. Um, there's a couple of things. Yes, fructose is the main problem. Um, fructose is what causes metabolic havoc. And you know, look, obesity is obviously of concern, but obesity I see as one symptom of the metabolic havoc that sugar causes. Um, it's not the problem. It's one of a few problems. Um, or many problems, I should probably say, and a growing number of problems. So fructose has been shown to be the main driver of, of, of those issues. Now, of course, fructose is never consumed in isolation. We consume it generally as sugar, which uh, contains 50% fructose and 50% glucose, or high fructose corn syrup, but not so much in Australia or the UK, um, or so in the US, of course. Um, now, Rice malt syrup is a complex carbohydrate that's essentially glucose. It's a blend of glucose and maltose breaking down into glucose. Um, it's 80% sugar um, or 80% carbs and then it's about 20% moisture. Um, the reason I use rice malt syrup, um, there's a few things. Um, first of all, I will add the caveat that where a cake might normally contain one or two cups of sugar, in mine it will contain a quarter of a cup of rice malt syrup. And what I do mm -hmm. is I use ingredients like sweet potato or coconut or nuts, you know, or coconut oil um, to provide extra sweetness. Um, so that's generally one thing I will say is that I limit all sweetness or any added sweetener even if I deem it a reasonably safe one. Um, with rice malt syrup, um, because it's a complex carbohydrate, it breaks down um, slower than say pure glucose. Um, and then of course because it contains no fructose, it doesn't cause the same metabolic havoc. Now having said that, there are a number of studies that show that just the sweet taste can cause um, problems with blood, blood sugar, you know, um, levels, addiction as well. Um, so even, you know, innocuous things like stevia that contain no sugar as such can trigger that response. So I use stevia as well, but I always warn people to use the smallest amount possible. I always use a, a, the smallest amount I think is appropriate for the general public, but then I invite people to scale it back even further over time as their taste buds shift. And so, you know, for instance, in my um, granola recipe, I don't use any sweetener, ditto in my chocolate recipes. Um, I just don't find it's required. And when I make most of the recipes in my book, I use about half the amount of sweetener. The other thing I say is um, it's to be enjoyed as a treat. You don't eat one of my pieces of cake for breakfast every day. It's to yeah. be enjoyed like <laughs> as a treat. Now, the thing that I then add to that is that because it doesn't contain fructose and because my meals all contain large amounts of high-quality fat, you can only eat one piece. You're not going to sit there and eat the whole damn cake. Um, you know, you're not going to sit there and eat a whole row of biscuits because you just physically can't. You know, you, the ap proper appetite mechanisms are all kind of kicked into gear, even with my sweet treats. So I hope that answers the question, but there's also lots of information along those lines on the website. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Perfect answer. Thanks a lot, Sarah. Um, and uh, people can actually sort of watch even more um, sort of below if you're on the website um, on um, on your talk at uh, Low Carb Auckland, which was kind of a, a really good lecture about more about sort of detail about kind of your your approach to um, to health and fitness and everything like that. And I, I know that you kind of clear, cleared this up in that talk a little bit as well. But um, yeah, thank you so much for your time today, Sarah. Um, My pleasure. Yeah, yeah really yeah, nice absolutely. to talk to you, brilliant. Absolutely. Um, and everybody can um, go check out the book um, on Amazon. Uh, if you head over to smashthefat.com forward slash IQS for Sarah's first book, and then for the second book, I Quit Sugar for Life, go to smashthefat.com forward slash IQSF. L and that'll take you straight through to Amazon and you can check it out there um, and uh, yeah was there, was there any other way that people can kind of get in touch with you I know you're real big on Instagram yeah well uh, there's um, I Instagram 
at um, underscore Sarah Wilson underscore, but then the I Quit Sugar team is at I Quit Sugar. Um, and obviously the iquitsugar.com site has lots of free information. And for anyone who's wanting more of a handheld experience, um, we run regular online programs. Now, I think by the time most of you listen to this, uh, you probably will miss out on our June intake. When, um, when does that start? Sorry, Sarah. Well, it actually um, it starts the well it starts actually the third of June. So um, cool. technically, cool. all registrations close on the third of June at midnight. But we'd accept one or two a little later than that. But yes, we kick off um, the following week. So uh, just depending on when this airs, it, you, uh, and when you and it goes straight up to YouTube, straight up. <laughs> it does. So, okay. Well, yeah. many of you will have twenty four hours to to enrol if you'd like to do that. There's lots of information on the website. Um, the online eight-week program, um, but otherwise, if you miss that, September um, will be rolling around fairly shortly. Absolutely, absolutely, perfect, perfect. Cool, and were there any other wise words that you want to leave us with? Um, well, whenever I can ask this, I generally find myself thinking of a mountain bike, I was a mad mountain biker for many years, and um, and uh, just to do 24-hour mountain bike races and all that with my brothers. And uh, I had this mantra, which was uh, where the mind goes, the energy flows. And you know, um, you know, you could just watch between two rocks, and your wheel will just go there. And I feel that way as well. If you if you actually get your head sort of sorted and you get clear on what you're doing here, and then back off, release your grip a little. You know, sit back in your seat. Uh, mm -hmm. Everything will then flow in that direction. And that's how you know you kicked off by asking me how I ended up in this kind of career sphere. Um, it was when I let go, um, but focused on what I believed in, but at the same time let go. It's a little bit of a tricky um, co you know concept. That's when things really started to flow, and it's the approach I use now. I've got 13 staff. Um, I've got a number of books coming out in the pipeline. Brilliant. It's all a lot easier once I quit sugar, and uh, and I release the grip and just just you know focused on where I was heading. Um, so I don't know if that's particularly Pollyanna-ish for a Monday morning for you all, but um, it <laughs> oh, certainly helps. Right. Absolutely, absolutely. That's, uh, that's very, very wise words from Sarah Wilson there. Thank you so much. Um, and yeah, I implore everybody just to at least head over to the to the website, iquitsugar.com, and check out all of Sarah's stuff there. Um, and uh, yeah, when uh, when your next books come out, we'd love to get you back on the show to, to chat about those. Um, and uh, yeah, until, until then, Sarah, uh, all we need now is a smash it out. So that's kind of our our tagline, so we need you to shout, smash it out on three. So one, two, three. Smash it out! Way There you go, <laughs> awesome. So yeah, everyone watching, listening to this, have a great week, be well, and of course, smash it out.